Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 17. Today we're going to talk about what happens to police when an enemy invades. Uh, using barrage balloons to interfere with drones. Xbox controllers on military equipment. Is Airsoft a good alternative to Miles Gear? And armed AI drones. Okay, to start, I'm going to be at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Next week doing an air assault with the 101st Airborne. And uh, believe me, traveling there and buying all this gear is not cheap. So this, this journalism thing is my job now. If you want to support the channel, toss me five bucks on Substack. Get a shirt, hoodie, or sticker from Bunker Branding. Or a cameo greeting from the person in your life who loves the channel. Let's get started. Ryan asks, I was wondering what happens to police officers during times of war when in hostile territory. Are they evacuated like civilians? Do they keep the peace after battle? Are they conscripted in times of need? Seems like I can't find any answers around it, and you seem like a knowledgeable source. So the truth is that it depends. Uh, and the treatment of police during an invasion varies. Police might get evacuated, or some might choose to stay behind to protect lives and property or help evacuate other people. Uh, as the invading force, it's usually a bad idea to let trained men with small arms and freedom of movement run around in your rear after an invasion. But you also need to help prevent the breakdown of law and order. Uh, when the coalition invaded Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom, we expected Iraqi police to remain at their posts, and they didn't. And it took about five years to get the Iraqi police retrained. It was absolute chaos during that time. When North, Vietnam, uh, when North Vietnam took over South Vietnam, police were hunted down and eliminated. Uh, during World War II, Germans allowed some French and Norwegians to continue law enforcement duties. But when the U.S. went into Japan after we dropped two atomic bombs, uh, the U.S. immediately disbanded the Japanese uh, Kempitai, which was kind of like a, a state police, gendarme kind of thing, more than, than a local police. Um, so one funny thing. Uh, during World War II in the European theater, uh, the U.S. Army actually allowed some German military police to continue their duties armed uh, even after they, they had surrendered to the U.S. Army. And that was because there just wasn't enough military police to uh, secure the rear areas and ensure the, the population was kept safe and to ensure that U.S. soldiers didn't act a fool and start doing stupid stuff. Uh, and this actually made its way into a Bill Maudlin cartoon. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is, it, it really depends on the country that's being invaded and the country that's doing the invading, whether they will keep the police around. Next up, Adam asks, with Russia attacking Odessa recently, would World War II style siege balloons, also known as barrage balloons or something similar, uh, interfere with drones or missiles? Using inert gas rather than hydrogen could be a cost-effective means for at least some air defense. So to start, Siege balloons or barrage balloons were mainly used during World War II. They were these tethered aerostats that were designed to give attacking pilots second thoughts about attacking a target. Because um, these balloons draped cables. And if you're doing a plane versus cable, the cable always wins. And this, the whole idea behind the barrage balloon is that you just you deter the pilots from wanting to attack that area. Because they don't know when they, when they line up for attack whether that whether well, that cable is going to smash into their plane. Um, it's not a bad idea, but the problem is that the psychological advantage you have from stringing these cables is lost on a cruise missile. Cruise missile doesn't have any sense of self-preservation. Cruise missile is just going to head toward its target. And since a, a cruise missile tends to be a lot uh, narrower than an aircraft, I don't know whether the barrage balloon cable could actually hit one of these cruise missiles. And the barrage balloon cable certainly wouldn't scare one of these cruise missiles. And that, that's the main factor. It's that psychological factor, which is going to be lost on any kind of cruise missile. So I don't believe that barrage balloons would be an effective deterrent against cruise missile attacks because the cruise missiles just don't get scared. Alejandro asks, how often is consumer-grade hardware used in military applications? What determines if a particular application requires specialized equipment? All this with a particular focus on video game console controllers in a high-stakes situation where a user's life depends on it. So uh, this question kind of came up after the Ocean's Gate submarine, the one that explored the Titanic and uh, imploded. Uh, people noticed that the sub was controlled by a video game controller. 
Uh, the Navy uses Xbox controllers to on Virginia-class submarines to operate their sensor masks. Uh, the Army uses Xbox controllers to control UAVs and uh, some bomb robots. And Israel is considered using an Xbox controller for its new tank. Um, and this is actually really useful because most young men grow up playing video games. And so using an Xbox controller is, is really, really intuitive. And it's also really cost efficient as well. And for applications where you're not dealing with a lot of dust and debris or a chemical or nuclear environment, you're dealing with a, a normal office or normal home environment, maybe with a, a little bit of sand, an Xbox controller is probably good enough. And that there's an old saying in engineering that perfect is the enemy of good. If an Xbox controller can handle 99% of the situations that you're gonna go into and soldiers already know it's ergonomics, why not use the Xbox controller? Now, we're probably not gonna use an Xbox controller to control a jet fighter. We're probably not gonna use an Xbox controller in a nuclear, biological, and chem chemical environment where you may have to decontaminate that Xbox controller later. But for some applications where you don't really have to worry about something being ruggedized or being exposed to chemicals, an Xbox controller is just fine. So typically in any kind of situation where you don't need ruggedized military grade hardware to do your thing, you're just controlling a bomb robot, an Xbox controller is just fine. Andrew asks, is Airsoft a good alternative to Miles gear to train soldiers for combat? So MILES is known as Multiple Integrated Laser Engagement System. It's basically laser tag for the Army. When you shoot a blank round, the transmitter fires, and if a soldier is wearing a receiver, the receiver will emit a tone and indicate that the soldier is dead. Uh, this was featured in the movie Heartbreak Ridge. Now, as to whether or not Airsoft would be a good replacement for MILES, you have to look at the I in MILES. I stands for integrated. MILES isn't just rifles. It's integrated in with tanks, machine guns, and missile launchers. There is no such thing as a 122 millimeter Airsoft round, right? And, and some of these weapon systems can reach out pretty darn far. Uh, the Army likes to base a lot of its fighting around machine guns. Um, and the maximum effective range of the Army's machine gun, the M240 Bravo, is 1,800 meters. So you're not making airsoft go 1,800 meters, but a laser can go out 1,800 meters easy. So maybe airsoft could be used in a CQB role where you're clearing buildings, but ultimately airsoft would not provide the same capability as miles because it just can't handle vehicle-based weapons and cruise serve weapons and machine guns that reach out to very long range. Finally, Alexei asks, let's say EW, electronic warfare, becomes too extensive that you cannot use drones at all. What's going to happen? I think new firmware will be created that will make drones fully autonomous. You can set a point on the map where the drone needs to fly to, and it will navigate only using pre-uploaded aerial maps. Once the trenches are spotted, another drone will be deployed to drop a munition. Hmm. This is a tough one because now you're talking about automated killing machines. And I've told people that we need to chill out of the automated killing machines because we've had them for years. The Patriot missile system is fully automated. The Aegis system is fully automated. But those tend to operate in domains that are a little more forgiving. You know, the, the, when the Patriot missile sees a theater ballistic missile, it doesn't have to worry about whether it's about to shoot down a civilian theater ballistic missile. Uh, you can be pretty darn sure this theater ballistic missile is, is an adversary missile. Uh, on the high seas, if the Navy is shooting down incoming missiles, there's probably not going to be any civilian air traffic around. So it can be free to act in, auto in an automated mode. When it comes to ground combat, that gets messy. That gets really messy. Now you're talking about an AI that has to identify uh, a farmer with a shotgun versus an insurgent with a rifle. There's a big difference. I'm not going to mess with, with a farmer who has a shotgun. He's just trying to keep his flock safe, you know, his, his sheep safe from wolves. But an insurgent with a rifle, I need to worry about that. So could AI differentiate between those two, uh, between those two scenarios and engage successfully? I don't know if we're at that point. 
And I also don't know if AI can contextually figure out whether it should engage or not. For example, if I saw a news crew, I might choose not to engage because I'd be thinking, wait a minute, why is a news crew here? Why are they filming this thing? Maybe, maybe they want us to attack this target so they can use it for propaganda purposes later. I don't know if AI can look at the totality of the situation and go, hey, um, maybe we shouldn't attack this place. I'm not going to do it. So I don't really see AI taking over the role of actually pulling the trigger unless it's under the control of humans. Uh, so what's going to happen is it, we're just going to go back to the 1980s and 90s where we didn't really have drones and we're using maps, paper maps, and we're using compasses to say, hey, the enemy's over here. We're calling up stuff over the radio or even calling up stuff over um, uh, field telephone lines. That's probably what's going to happen. I, I envision the EW spectrum being so full that you could cook a turkey just by, by putting it on a stick and holding it up in the air, there's going to be so much electromagnetic radiation flying around. Uh, so I, what I believe is that just soldiers will operate in a degraded condition that will be similar to the way soldiers used to operate in the uh, 1980s and 1990s. And that's all we got for this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Mr. President? Yeah, that's me. I'm the president, man. Hey, little tugboat, did someone drop your anchor? Uh, it's three o'clock in the morning, Mr. President. Well, it's not like you got some girl in bed with you to wake up. Listen, you freaking nerd. I've got a problem. It's my vice principal, man. You're who? Come on, man. Camilla. Miss Harris, if you're nasty. She's got a nerf day coming up, man. I, I gotta get her a presentation. Oh, Mr. President, I how about a Ryan Beth t-shirt from Bunker Branding? I've got Think Outside the Bomb, Live Laugh Launch, for Patriot and for High Mars, Department of the Boat People, Landmine Marker shirts, and even Hell on a Wire. A lot of these come in hoodies and stickers as well. Yeah, I'll get a Ryan Beth t-shirt from Bunker Branding. Macbeth, he saved the reputation of the tight house. Not the tight house, the, the tight house. The, the, the building, man, with the Rose Garden. Get with the program, man. Happy to help, Mr. President. And be sure to get yours at BunkerBranding.com.